Welcome to the 12th episode of Season 3 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Monday the 19th of July 2010. In this episode, we're going to talk to Joe Shields about his work on Ubuntu. We'll talk about where and how we should promote Ubuntu. We will, of course, cover the latest news, events, a bit about Ubuntu, and go over your feedback. I'm Simon, and it's the standard four at the moment. So this week, Tony. Hello, how are you doing? Very well. You've been on holiday? I have. It was great. Cool. I had two days off. <laughs> that was quite good too. Um, what have I been doing? I have been um, eBaying a load of old kit. Um, some audio kits, some computers that I found around my house. You wouldn't believe how many computers I found when I started to poke around my house. Did you find any of them? It's not a big house. <laughs> not have, you big... Sold my, have you sold my juggler on eBay? Uh, no, <laughs> not, not yet. yet <laughs> but I'll give me a chance when I get back home. Um, it's yeah, amazing uh, what people will buy. It is, yeah. Um, old old laptops and old PCs and Hang stuff. Hang on, is this going to turn into an advert for <laughs> Tony's eBay? Come to Tony's to eBay store. No, no, but uh, trying to uh, get rid of some kit, recycle it give it to people who find it useful, uh, make a little bit of cash if I can as well. And uh, I've been using D-Band to uh, wipe all the hard disks on these things. So Derek's Boot and Nuke, it stands for. Oh, really? um, but it does all sorts of Department of Defense, so the, presumably the US Department of Defense, um, standard wipes and, and things. Interesting. I need some drives. Uh, need treating with that. Yeah. Um, it beats hitting them with a big mallet. <laughs> oh, that's, no, that is, is good fun. Especially I've done that. It's good fun, but it rather reduces their retail value. <laughs> yeah. We seem to have a lot of hard drives. Yeah. Again, if you're interested in buying them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put a link to Tony's eBay store. Yeah. <laughs> what have you been up to, Laura? Um, well, it says in the show notes, I've been moonlighting on another podcast, which isn't strictly true. I got a mention on another geeky podcast. Which was that? Um, home Camp. Oh, yeah. Ah, Mike's Home Camp. Mike's Home Camp. Mike the Bee. At Mike the Bee's Home Camp podcast. Um, because I asked a question on the Home Camp Google group. Oh, home camp is a um, uh, kind of f- informal bar camp. community. All oh, right, okay. Um, built around. There's been two kind of bar camp events now in London, I think. Um, all around uh, home automation and power saving, power saving, yeah. energy monitoring, anything. It's sort of combination of green and technology. And uh, they've got a Google group, so I was curious about whether it was possible to sort of replace our heating controller which is a wireless digital heating controller with um a pc and an arduino um that would just send on and off commands quite simple and it wouldn't involve taking the boiler apart or anything (laughs) so uh, i asked the question on the google group and it started about well that thread went well and then another couple of threads after that it was really really interesting yeah really geeky so I was very proud of that because well <laughs> I didn't provide most of the information. Um, but yeah, because then Mike the Bee then does a summary of what's been happening in the oh, past oh, cool. couple of weeks or so on his podcast and then mentioned my name. Excellent. We'll um, put a link to the um, yeah. podcast in the show notes. And I've got a pimp on my blog. And <laughs> cool, cool. Baby, tell us about your Mac. <laughs> well, you may recall <laughs> that I bought a Mac laptop and, uh, sorry, an Apple laptop and I tried to put Ubuntu on it and the standard Lucid installer won't see the hard drive. There's a problem with the SATA controller. So Dave, who is a star and is currently out in Prague with Canonical on a sprint. Yep. Um, has Didn't been know into running. <laughs> no, I don't think he is. Uh-huh. Not that kind of sprint. Uh-huh. Um, he also has exactly the same laptop and has the same problem. And he worked on making an ISO image which had the right drivers on it. And I tested it and a few other people tested it. And it's now in uh, a Lucid update so you can now um install um ubuntu on this particular model of mac laptop and it works okay there are some quirks with it still like the mouse and the keyboard lights and you know various bits and bobs but it's yeah it's good it's been a bit frustrating being stuck in os10 but you bought the hardware (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I did. And I bought it, you know, as I've mentioned previously, <laughs> under instruction from someone who works from Canonical, saying it will be all right, everything will work. <laughs> Lies. Is that what you're running at the moment? Is what, what I'm running at the moment? Ubuntu. No. no. Well, right now while you're looking at me. Well, right now. Yeah. No, because the mouse is a bit twitchy on Ubuntu, and I need to. I, there's some special modules you need to comp- download and compile and stuff at the moment. Sounds it's a bit like bleeding a lot of hard edge. work. You need to replace it with it's a not actually that much. We've got, we've got um, a group who document each of the quirks with the Mac um, <laughs> because there's stuff that the Mac has that people, other people don't have like a yeah. variable illuminating light, um, keyboard light and um, other bits and bobs. Hey, I bought an HP laptop. Do you know what? It just <clears throat> works. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Fantastic. Yeah, it's ugly though. Negative. It's, not. <laughs> it's, it's really funny. not ugly, that one. 
<laughs> so it's sweet. Have you done anything with computer in the last fortnight at all, Simon? No. You've there had your go. Android phone attached to you. I have had my Android phone, but I've been out of the country and I've actually been cold turkey. <gasps> cool. No internet connectivity. Wow. Sweaty um, palms? No. It was mm. quite good, actually. About the third day, and I got a bit sort of, oh, I need to check my email. But I thought, no, I'm not. I just left it, and it was fine. Yeah, it's good to unplug every so often, isn't it? Yeah, the interesting thing, when I came, when I got to the airport, I couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I uh, logged on to my email. I had 300 emails. Okay, let's see how long this takes. And out of all the emails, I think three were directed to me and took about five minutes to clear. The rest were um, email lists, Nothing direct, just you know, delete. Doesn't um, that delete make you feel I'd... popular? No, it doesn't <laughs> not at all because it's all just you know list stuff. And mm-hmm. if it's really important, they'll get back to me. So it's the easy way to deal with all those emails and uh, the news feed as well. Like two thousand um, uh, articles to read in there. Right. Just highlight the lot. Delete. Gone. Not going to read them. And, inbox uh, zero. Yeah, inbox zero. It took about ten minutes. <laughs> Great. When we're going to do a segment at some point about managing your email, that's it the way sounds like you've just done it. it. <laughs> there we go, job done. If you Control got loads, a delete, delete. Yeah. Well, seriously. Cool. Right. Well, let's get on with the show. We're delighted to have on the phone uh, Joe Shields, otherwise known as Direct Hex on IRC. Hello, Joe. How are you? Uh, I'm all right. Uh, getting by. How are you guys? Yeah, tickety boo. Not too bad. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us. Yeah, thanks. So probably. Um, some people won't know who you are. I can't imagine who these people Crazy are. Fools. Um, but do you want to give us a brief intro to, you know, what you do for Ubuntu and Debian? Right, okay. Um, I'm a Motu, or have you pronounce, so to pronounce that, and a Debian developer. Um, I've sort of been contributing since around 2008, I think, when I started officially contributing to Ubuntu. And I am kind of one of the senior people who helps work on mono and mono related stuff and, so is that and all that packaging that packaging mostly yeah bug, bug fixing, fixing that kind of thing right. do you do the same things for debian as you do with ubuntu is it mono based work yes okay uh, and what attracted you to work on mono i was doing a project at work and i need to write some software um and i because i'm a systems manager um for my day job and I have to write some software to do something, I did the obvious thing and wrote it in Perl. Right. Um, and then I quickly discovered that writing a large GUI application in Perl becomes very unmaintainable very quickly. So I started hunting around for other ways to, to write software for Linux, because this was sort of a, a Linux-only project, and I wanted to write a GUI app. Um, and I, I tried a few things here and there. I had a look at, at what was current, and this is going back 2007, I think. Okay. And of all the things I tried, the best by a huge margin, even though it wasn't 100%, was um, Bono Develop and C Sharp. Best in what way? I just, I found it relatively intuitive to work with. I thought the, the GUI editing stuff was, was pleasant, um, and it seemed relatively easy to get working. Just the whole workflow thing appealed to me as a programmer. So I started using it. And then it started becoming the case that the packages in Ubuntu for, for the modern development stuff weren't getting as much attention from their maintainer as I thought they needed. Um, the, the guy who was previously the Ubuntu mono maintainer got busy with other projects. So I sort of stepped up to help there. And so you started work on mono, in, uh, mono packages in Ubuntu first and then uh, filtered up to Debian, is that right? Yeah, well, b- before even that, I was working on an unofficial third-party repository where I was sort of keeping my own updates um, because they weren't happening in Ubuntu. And then I thought, you know, this would be a lot easier if I just did it in Ubuntu. Right. And then I started doing it in Ubuntu and thought, you know, this would be a lot easier if I just did it in Debian. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. Sorry, so you started off as an Ubuntu, de- Ubuntu developer and then became a Debian developer? Is yep, that the way around? that's okay. way around. Was it difficult going from one discipline to another? Honestly, not not really. I mean, there there are a f- it's a lot harder to become a Debian developer. It's it's really quite a they quiz you on on, on technical skills and things in a way that they don't for Ubuntu. Do you have to sit in a like in the for on Ubuntu? You have the developer membership board meeting on IRC that you sit in, and you know they quiz you about various things. I think to be a mode to isn't that the case? You basically get an exam. <laughs> That's the only right. way to phrase it. It's about thirty questions. 
Wow. Um, and these are involved things like talking about uh, version symboling in C and, and all of that. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pretty involved stuff in there. Tony um, does that in his sleep, apparently. <laughs> Does Tony know what C but is? I had to do a bit of research for some of those because I wasn't really interested in some of the things that the questions were, were written around because right. I assumed that I'd know about Emacs modules and that kind of thing. <laughs> Blimey. <laughs> oh, my God. It's quite hardcore, isn't it? It's, it's pretty hardcore, but the, the main focus of, of doing this was that anyone can contribute to Debian. You don't have to be a Debian developer or a Debian maintainer to contribute to Debian, but you can only upload a package if you're a Debian developer. So I spent a while contributing to Debian as a way to get stuff into Ubuntu. Um, But we had one Debian developer um, who was actively working on mono stuff. So if he went on holiday, then nobody else would be able to upload any (laughs) mono-related stuff. Um, So I became a Debian developer basically to help him um, even out the workload, as it were, from contributors and we've got a few people uh, contributing to to mono on on ubuntu and debian so now now that you're on both sides of the fence as it were do you do you package for debian first is that your first target now and then that filters down that's always my first target um and it's very uncommon that there are situations where it's not possible to go to debian first and even when it's not even if you've got to make changes for ubuntu you should be able to put 99% of it into Debian and then just have a couple of lines difference in Ubuntu. I was quite surprised that you said that uh, Ubuntu had fallen behind um, in the version of Mono and things that it was running because Mono is quite essential to some core Ubuntu apps like FSpot. It is. Um, Was that not a problem? If stuff just keeps working, then uh, you tend not to pay attention to it. Right. So as long as it wasn't crashing horribly, people were just fine with whatever they were getting. Um, and and what, what ended up happening is people who didn't really know about Mono were doing the, the updates to packages. So they were taking the Debian version and making their best efforts to do an update without necessarily understanding why certain things were done the way they were. Right. Uh, and we, are, we only have a couple of core applications um, on the CD, but a few extra things in the, in the repository. And there's a few other things, a few other apps that... Um, are written in or use the mono libraries like iFolder that you know is is quite a decent apparently a decent app but doesn't seem to be packaged is that something you're you're looking to work on uh, iFolder I've looked at it and I've I've tried to do some work on it the the short answer is it's probably the biggest challenge I've ever faced in packaging wow and I've packaged to monsters <laughs> and it, what, what, what is it, is it it's nothing to do with it actually being a mono app it's more is it, is it what, what is the blocker there you're right it's not so much that it's a mono app it's just the way it's been in, been written um, for example there's a lot of hard coding in a lot of places to, well, hard coding for novel stuff or the SUSE way yeah right um, or for configuration um, everything's supposed to be configured through um, Susie-ish apps that write config files in Susie-ish ways. And <laughs> it's trying to decouple that, trying to make it so that, for example, you can compile the, the desktop client and the server out of the same source package, which is actually remarkably difficult to do with the way that iFold has been written. Right. And things like that. So I, I kind of made a, a preliminary hack um, and there's a, a Google Groups group who who had a go with it. But I had some other stuff on that I had to take care of, and I haven't gone back to it because every time I think of going back and finishing it, I just think, oh, God, I don't want to work on this. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems that a few people have attacked that particular package, but and, and none have come out victorious. Um, but that that package aside, does the negative press that Mono gets mean that people are less likely to get involved in it do you think i think probably i think it would be naive not to i'm not going to name any names because i don't know if it was said in confidence by <laughs> at uds in barcelona i forget which year that was um i spoke to a developer who said he would much rather be writing the app in c sharp but he wrote it in python because if he wrote it in c sharp he wouldn't get any contributors yeah. mm, that's which is sad because it's free software isn't it it is free software, and this is one of the one of the troubles with the whole mono debacle. There, there are 
you know, some vehemently anti-mono people in the world. And obviously you come, uh, being that you're someone who is deeply involved in mono, you, you come across these people, don't you? Uh, you could say that, yeah. So what's it like? Um, do, do you, are you on the receiving end of some of their anger and their, their vigour? Do you, do you take it personally or do you manage to let it um, sort of go over your head? Uh, I used to. Honest answer, I, I got really worked up over it for a while. I found it really depressing to be attacked constantly. Um, and then I just started ignoring it, which mm. is very easy to do when you start adding entries to etc. hosts to block certain <laughs> web pages. <laughs> Um, and since then, just ignoring it helps. I mean, when all said and done, it's like getting concerned and going, those Tea Party people in the U.S. won't believe the president is really an American. That's not fair wow. You know, mm. you may as well just write off the people you think are crazy as crazies. Right. There's no point trying to convince people who are that certain about what they think. And one of the, and I remember a recent blog post, um, related to this um you had a bit of a rant about the fact that one of the uk tv networks has switched away from the um silver light based yes. content delivery system they use what what was the what was the big problem with that i mean there, there don't seem to be that many websites that use silver light or in any way there aren't that many websites using silver light because flash has got the market dominance mm -hmm. which is the same argument people use for saying well windows has got market dominance so that's um, not use Ubuntu, yeah. <laughs> the, here's the thing. If you want to watch TV online with the Adobe plugin, then you're fine. You can watch your Channel 4, your, your ITV, they work. But let's face it, the Adobe plugin is awful. It was really, really bad. And I've been using 64-bit Linux for about seven years now, I think. Mm -hmm. So I know just how awful it can be trying to do flash uh, online and if you want to use a free software plugin because free software always has the potential to be better you can't watch any of those mm -hmm. none of the UK networks work with free software plugins but one of them used to mm -hmm. ITV used to work with free software because they were using Silverlight and not flash but it required some bleeding edge version of it did need a bleeding edge version I had um, some spirited debate, debates with the, um, the the Moonlight Upstream people asking them to make a new release with just the right version so I could package it up, um, right. which I unfortunately didn't get. So I had it working. Uh, I demonstrated it working. I had screenshots of it working, although I, unfortunately I took screenshots just as the screen was going black for a transition. <laughs> <laughs> didn't help. <Dope. laughs> And uh, given I was um, demonstrating it in my usual sarcastic manner with a chinchilla in view, it's really hard to get those things to stand still. <laughs> so I had two chances with two chinchillas, and I just used the least black of the two screenshots. Yes. Um, but it worked, is, is the short version. It worked, and since they moved to Flash, it doesn't. Yeah. And I tried with with what I thought was an update version of Nash. I haven't been told it works with anything newer. It is so, frustrating that we have to rely on, you know, these third-party plugins that are non-free. But it, it seems every, everyone has to, you know, unless you happen to be Apple and you control the platform and you don't allow <laughs> Flash. Well, that, that's a different argument. Apple are just being deceitful with that. But, um, yeah, it's frustrating because it, it did work. It was... An example where you could say, look, free software does everything. You know, you, if you had uh, a spouse who spends a lot of time watching shows on, on ITV, like, I don't know, the Jeremy Kyle show. <laughs> and I know you have that one, one of those, because the other show she likes watching, I probably shouldn't mention on the air. Okay. Um, you know, uh, her, her netbook runs uh, Ubuntu, and she could watch everything she wanted, do everything she wanted, top to bottom with free software until ITV moved on to Flash, and then she couldn't. Then she had to start using the Adobe plugin. Mm. So I found that frustrating, and what I found especially frustrating was that it was hailed as a victory by the, the, the so-called free software advocates. Right. Because it was not mono. Because it was not mono. Not and, because it was Flash. And similarly, another one that I thought was a better example, in, in the US, 
Major League Baseball did their high definition um, streaming with Silverlight, and then they dropped that, which was seen as a victory by the free software people. Mm. But what they dropped it for was Flash with an extra Windows only add in to make it use Windows Media Video. Right. Nice. So, so this must be obviously frustrating, but but equally, looking at it from a user's perspective, if there isn't an easy, viable way to get the Silverlight compatible free software stuff to make that work, then they're going to see, oh, it's gone to Flash. Great, that's a success, aren't they? Because I can probably. now watch it, you know. <laughs> Very probably, but um, call me a purist if you like. I just... You're a purist. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was asking for trouble. <laughs> it was. So, one of the other things... Um, yeah, we, we talked about this in the last episode. We talked about your Grub splash screen that you've developed. Um, tell us a little bit about why you did that. Um, okay, apparently Grub has supported graphical splash screens since 2008. Really? But nobody's ever made one. Wow. Oh. That seems implausible. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, I believe um, you, but... You know. Basically, someone did support for it as a Google Summer of Code project. Oh. Right. And it got committed, but then no one ever fixed up the, the example themes to work with the committed version of, uh, of the graphics menu support. Right. So um, is it, is it a significant amount of work to do to create a theme? It. Sorry. Is it a significant amount of work to create a theme? Not really. I mean, there, there were some bugs. I, I Basically, because I was the first one using this code in anger, I've reported a few bugs, and they tend to get fixed very quickly by... Uh, the, the guy who's currently maintaining that code is a, a great uh, guy called sort of, uh, PH Coder. Um, and basically every time I make a release, I tend to say it needs this exact uh, bizarre revision because that's the version that's got all the fixes that I asked for. So is this something that you think we'll see in Maverick or a future Ubuntu release? I Honestly, I doubt it because it delays booting by about half a second to a second. Oh, we can't have that. Mm. And we can't have that. But I expect it, I, I would hope that um, the the Grub packager, uh, Colin Watson, I think, is yeah. still packaging it. I would hope that he would package it up such that you could have it if you wanted it. That would be quite cool because it is quite pretty. It's certainly prettier than the default Grub menu. Yes. Yeah, well, that, this is the thing. If you're going to have a nice, pretty distro, there's no reason to have a crummy-looking... Uh, yeah, it looks like mm. you step back to the era of teletypes yeah. when you boot your machine. And yeah. what, the only people who see that are the people who are dual-booting. Yeah, which is by a lot of people. It hides it, and it only shows it if there's multiple OSs to show. Um, it would be nice if those people got a nice experience. Or I think so, anyway. And does it segue nicely into the boot splash? Is it a seamless transition, or is there a bit of flickering? And It's not seamless in any environment I've tested it, but right. I haven't really tried any of the frame buffer fiddling in anger. Right, okay. But I that, think that's a problem for all of all of the um, the boot-up things. I've not seen any. Sure. I mean, some of them are claiming to be, you know, pretty clean and mm. less flickering, but I don't know any machine I own that doesn't at some point show me a black screen with a flashing cursor. Yeah, exactly. It would be cool to not have that at any point yeah. after the BIOS. It would be cool, but it's not something I worry about. I let the Grub guys worry about that. <laughs> Fair Fair and the X guys. And, and the X guys and the Kernel guys now as well. Yeah. Mm. Cool. There was one question, um, but going back to Ubuntu and De- uh, being an Ubuntu and Debian developer, and do you ever find there's a conflict of interest between putting things in one and the other? Because I think a lot of people don't really appreciate what the process is for each of the two distributions. Honestly, I don't think so. I think people, what people ignore is that most of what's in Ubuntu is copied byte for byte from Debian. I mean, there's about, I think, 18,000 source packages, something along those lines, mm-hmm. which is a big number. And there's about 1,000 Debian developers, and there's rather less Ubuntu contributors. Yeah. So right. just in terms of the amount of work to do, it makes sense to, to sort of minimise the duplication of effort. So every time I can, I will try and put something into, um, into Debian first. And there are a couple of examples where I can't. So an example there is, is Moonlight, 
Um, I can't update the package in Debian because I have a disagreement with the security team over the, the little issue of Moonlight needing an entire copy of the mono source code in order to compile, and they don't like having copies of source code lying around. What, so, in, on, uh, on our post-install or in the repo? Um, just to, to compile the package in the repo. Surely everything needs the source code in the repo to compile. Well, Moonlight needs its own copy of the mono source. It doesn't just oh. use the system's mono source. It needs its own local, slightly forked copy. Ugh. Um, Sounds vaguely agree. FFmpeg-like. It, it, icky. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think Chromium does the same thing, except it bundles about 18 different major libraries. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's icky, it's horrible, I agree. But the reality of the situation is if you want the software, then sometimes you have to put up with stupidities from upstream. Yeah. Um, so that's when I put directly into, uh, into Ubuntu. And as it happens, I actually forgot to upload an updated package to that. So I can do that right now, live on air. <laughs> as you are listening to this podcast, I'm uploading a Moonlight package. Well, what's for uploading? Um, I, uh, I did some packaging uh, a little while ago, not packaging, some, some bug work. And uh, I went through the frustration of understanding um, that once you've done the work on Ubuntu, you've then got to go and do it on Debian, uh, which appears to be where you've come from. So are you almost at the point where you're not doing any work on Ubuntu, you're doing all of it on Debian because you know it's going to filter downstream eventually? About 95%. Yeah. But I, the way I see it, the only times I need to upload to Ubuntu are when there's a really big blocker on me uploading to Debian. Okay. And even things like, say, after feature freeze in Ubuntu, I will still upload it to Debian and then sync across to Ubuntu. <laughs> do you know what kind of proportion of Ubuntu developers do both Debian and Ubuntu work? Honestly, I have no idea. Um, someone was looking at this. Uh, I think they gave a talk at UDS. I'm trying to remember who it was, though. Yes, they uh, did. Lucas? Yes. Lucas Nassabom? Or Nussbaum, or whatever. Yes. I don't want to embarrass myself by pronouncing it, but there you go. Leave that to us. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> Lucas Nussbaum was... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Please done. edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I have no idea um, what percentage go where. Um, I know that there is a perception that Debian doesn't welcome random contributors, um, and for some packages that's true, and I think that's just the perception people have now, is if you contribute to Debian, you'll get people shouting at you for not being enough or whatever and not reading the documentation fully and yeah making your debian control files absolutely letter perfect yeah um and i think for some packages that's true some of them are considered a bit weird even by debian standards <laughs> um, and i'm especially not naming names there <laughs> well we had the uh, debian project lead come to um, the ubuntu developer summit yeah. and uh, talk about the relationship between debian and ubuntu and he seems to think it's going fairly well I think, well, certainly within the bits I work on, it is as well. To give a bit more background to that, which is sort of heading back in time a bit, when I wanted to start contributing more formally to, to Mono in Debian, um, it was around the time that they were looking at doing a major transition on, um, on the way that some packaging is done, which would reduce the amount of space it takes to install stuff like F-Spot and Tomboy. Uh -huh. um, and it was a fairly major piece of work. It needed patching about 90 packages. Um, and I thought, well, that's a lot of work for like one or two guys. But how about if I get as many Ubuntu contributors as I can find to help and we can get it done in like a couple of months instead of the six, seven, eight months he was estimating. Right. Um, and we did. Oh. We got the whole transition done in time for a release. And the, the main... Uh, Debian Mono guy was just ecstatic with, with how helpful everyone was with the amount of contribution he got. And these were just general Ubuntu developers, not, no one who has a specific interest in Mono or the specific yeah. packages. I mean, some of them have stuck around now to help on, on Mono stuff. But That's rather cool. Yeah. And it basically completely changed his perception of, of Ubuntu and, and the whole Debian-Ubuntu um, relationship cool. for the better. So now he, he has a PPA for one of his packages where he, he uploads things like that because he cares about the Ubuntu users. And he moans at me 
for not putting enough Ubuntu changes back into Debian. <laughs> right. Good, as it should be. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, it's been fantastic talking to you, and thank you for uh, letting us know all about the work you do for Debian and Ubuntu. Yeah, we better leave you to get on with uploading those packages. And stroking your chinchilla in a yes. weird well, overlord way. Which is not a dog, apparently. Things, so yes. there we go, contributing to the evil of uh, <laughs> mono-infection. Excellent. People tell me, and I even name-checked the podcast in there. So, uh, oh, who does it? Fantastic. Check the Debian change log file once that hits Maverick. <laughs> oh, that, wow. <laughs> Lovely. Excellent. Fame at last. I think we were, we've been in the man page, haven't we, before? Yeah. So now we're going to be in a commit log as well. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. Anyway, anyway, thank you for uh, talking to us this evening, Joe. No problem. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 And it's time for the news. The popular music streaming application Spotify is coming to Linux. A preview release of a native Linux client appeared last week. Previously, we'd had to resort to running the Windows version under Wine, which apparently worked quite well. It did. Are you a Spotify user? I have an account, and I installed it and went, yeah, that works. And Spotify works, are you sort of a pay uh, a monthly subscription or something like that, and you nope. can access music? I think it has different you? models. It's got oh, okay. multiple different what, schemes. Oh. What's the difference between that and Last.fm? Because I've never used Spotify. Uh, Last.fm is completely free, isn't it? Yeah. Although you can pay for a pro account, I guess, with Last.fm, I think. But I don't. Well, it's good to see... Proper applications. Proper applications. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. Popular Windows applications coming to Linux. And Mac applications. <laughs> <laughs> Except name, iTunes. Name one. Popular Mac application that's come to Linux. Spotify. Oh, okay. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> Google Labs have released App Inventor, a visual development environment for Android applications. They claim that no programming experience is necessary to create even complex applications, like one using the GPS facility. Hmm. Really? Yeah, it's got like a drag and droppy, like you pull in uh, a piece that is like a loop and you pull in a piece that calls something and right. you, you can construct a program just by pulling in building blocks. It's a bit like um, a flowchart. You sort of construct a flowchart if X or Y do A and B or whatever. Yeah, um, but, but without fact, actually having to know any of the, the nitty gritty of the programming language underneath. Mm. It generates the code for you. Right. Some would argue that it generates rubbish code because all code <laughs> generators generate rubbish yeah. code. But it's a good in, like, if someone's like, you know, children want to learn, and some adults want to mm-hmm. learn programming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, get a proof of concept of your application, and then mm-hmm. maybe if it's successful enough initially, you could get it written properly, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Well, it's kind of aimed Optimized. at educators. When you, if you, right. you can't actually download it, you have to um, uh, request an invite or request a, a download, and it asks you like basic questions and then one of them is um about what you know what do you do and why should we give you an invite to this right. and it kind of implies that they would probably prefer you to be an educator of some site hmm. teacher or trainer or hmm. something fair enough linux mint have started to move away from being based on ubuntu to being based on debian testing this seems to be to allow rolling releases and there's clearly no sentimentality towards ubuntu from the linux mint team We've never considered our goal to be linked to Ubuntu in any way. We consider Ubuntu one of the upstream components that we'll use on some of the systems we distribute, the way we distribute GNOME. Hmm. Is that a quote from their announcement? Yes. Hmm. Yes. So this isn't, they're not the only people to be moving away from uh, Ubuntu. Yeah. No, who, who, who else did? Crunchbang. Crunchbang, yes. Mm. Oh, yeah, of course. Phil yeah. Newbra. Phil Newbra. Mm. And we so even what, interviewed him. So what's the attraction, do you reckon, of Debian testing over Ubuntu? I don't think it's the attraction as the repulsion. <laughs> that's a negative Ubuntu. way of putting it. Well, that's the way they've put it, really. Yeah. Yeah. I think they don't like the commercial side of things, like the tight integration of things like Ubuntu One and landscape and that kind of stuff. But they don't have to ship that. Uh, no, but it does quite tightly integrate to Ubuntu now. So, you know, some of the... I don't know how easy it is to, to pull that out. Unpick it. Yeah. All right. I mean, for example, now... Um, Maverick has even more close integration with Ubuntu One, which maybe we'll talk about when we come to talk about Maverick at some point. Yeah, well, maybe that maybe Ubuntu is less suitable now as a platform for other derivatives than it once yeah. was. Um, but it, the, the idea of moving to testing so you can have a rolling release program is quite a, a, a change in the way that they are obviously running their distribution as well. Mm. Because you, you're not doing set releases every six months, so you're almost I think having it was a quite, rolling. I think it was quite painful for them doing a, a release, like having to right. redo everything after each Ubuntu release. Yeah, um, that must be pretty painful. Whereas the rolling 
might might make it easier, especially testing where you've got things that have had some element of testing in unstable. Yeah. yeah. So comparing this to the um, Apple Store um, versus Android um, debate we just had, are we going to get some um, a better product out of Debian or a better product out of Ubuntu? Because we theory, being well, the users, users, the users. Are the, are the users, users going to get Linux Mint? Yeah. Right. Are they going to get a better product out of Debian or a better product out of Ubuntu? Bear in mind, a lot of the developers for Ubuntu are well paid, and you know. How do you measure better? Is uh, better more free, less commercial interest, or is better more stable, or is better well, rolling releases, or is better? I want my release to be more stable, and I only want it changed every six months, or, or more sustainable. Hmm. I, th- I think I could see how moving or more to, brown to Debian or purple, purple. Oh, sorry, purple. Uh, aubergine. I, I think I could see how moving to Debian testing might be more, uh, may, might save some effort for the Linux Mint team mm-hmm. on a technical basis. I could mm-hmm. see that. But there's, there's the philosophical thing as well that Debian's always made out to be. It always makes itself out to be the kind of won't stand for anything that's non-free and things. Whereas Ubuntu is pragmatic. <laughs> whereas Ubuntu does. <laughs> Yeah, well, you say that, but I always thought that Linux Mint, a version of Linux Mint, shipped with all kinds of extra stuff, codecs and Flash. Did it not at some point in the past? So I'm not sure that that's an argument that they would necessarily use. Yeah, I think you're right. I think yeah. you're right, it did. Which was, which was one of the reasons why it was touted as being good for users. Yeah. is because you didn't have to worry about codecs and Flash and fonts mm. and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, because it was all just there. So I'm not sure that would be a motivating factor for them. I think yeah. probably... I mean, for some it will be, obviously. IBM have announced that Mozilla Firefox will be their default browser, citing Firefox's extensibility and standards compliance as major motivators. That's 400,000 employees who will now be asked to use Firefox instead of Internet Explorer. Asked, as in they can turn it down. As in they can choose to use something else. IE's already on your Windows machine, isn't it? Mm. Um, It's probably pretty hard to rip it out, really. Presumably this means that IBM have made all their internal systems work with Firefox and be compatible. You'd hope so. You'd hope so. <laughs> it's going to really annoy the employees if they can't do their expenses because it doesn't work in Firefox. The uh, the blog post was from Bob Suter, who is a vice president of open source and Linux for IBM. And uh, he says that there's going to be support and things for people who want help moving to a different browser if they need it. Um, it's funny because I, I look around at work, the office that I work in, which is you know, a fairly decent sized company and full of non-technical people. There's a fair number of them who've already made the switch, whether it's sanctioned by their local mm. IT or not. They've already chosen to switch to Firefox or Chrome. A lot I, of people are using Chrome. Ironically, I see the opposite in that there are people that are incredibly techy, developing all day, every day, and they're still naive. And that I, always kind of surprises me. Yeah, it's, I see a few of those. And but you then don't I, even have Firefox installed, even. But then some, yeah, some people, technical people make some wacky decisions. <laughs> I, I work with people who. SSH to a box and then start a VNC server on a server and then VNC in and then start and then 10 X terms. <laughs> yeah. I've tried to get them to use GNU screen right. and shown them the joy of split screen and, and, and being able to have multiple windows open in screen and then disconnect from the SSH session and walk to another machine and SSH in and go, look, it's all still there. And um, they're like, yeah, but VNC works. Well, okay. Lost cause. This, uh, that's a massive topic of discussion. We should get into some time about these people. Yeah. <laughs> these really. people. Yeah, these people. Those, Techie, techies those, who aren't really. Those people over there. <laughs> who need a real good <laughs> that's, slap in. <laughs> that's everyone other than us. Yeah, yeah. what's wrong with that? Yeah. yeah. They're all wrong. Splitters, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Especially those people that won't use Biobi. But that's another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Only a couple of events on the schedule today. OIGCOM oh, is on the 24th of July in London. That's and, this goes, Saturday. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm going. Still. Still going. <laughs> you can still sit behind Alan in I'm a tied talk. up, literally. Oh, well. No, you're not going. Ah, ah. that's different. No. <laughs> Software Freedom Day is on the 18th of September all around the world. Excellent. Is there stuff happening in the UK? Uh, actually, it's funny you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's very sounded very slightly prepared. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just half an hour ago, uh, Les Pounder sent a mail to say he's going to be doing an Ubuntu install fest uh, on Software Freedom Day, 18th of September, in the Manchester area. Brilliant. Now, oh. Les, Les ran the Ubuntu install desk at uh, Ogcamp. Yes, that's right. Tent, so who's, and at Barcamp Blackpool. At 
So that's very good. That's and he's going to take along his juggler. It's a nice northern event. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. Yeah. I was just about to say. And if anyone else wants to run one in the Outer Hebrides or the Isle of Man or um, Penzance Wales. or Wales or wherever, then um, you could, we'll put a link to the um, the post. Northern Ireland, Millbank Towers. Anywhere. My Wolverhampton. House. No. <laughs> And finally, don't forget the Geek Nick in London on Sunday the 8th of August. Whereabouts in London? Um, we'll put a link in the show notes. Okay. There's a big list where you can put your name down and um, say that you're coming. So it's yeah. a picnic in a park with geeks. And uh, significant others and other people as well. Okay, cool. So it's, it's designed to be a family event. Sounds like fun. Let's hope it doesn't rain. I think they're going to have alternative plans for this if it great. rains. An umbrella. Bus shelter. <laughs> <laughs> in your car. Well then, Alan, how did the Ubuntu in Business event go last week? <laughs> yeah, that wasn't contrived at no, all. No, that wasn't a setup. <laughs> now, how did it go? Because I was seeing uh, various tweets from the event uh, on the day itself. It looked like um, Alan Bell was very, very tall up in the roof. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, a strange, it was a strange venue. Uh, it was in Brick Lane mm. in London, and it was called Ubuntu in Business. Oh, Brick Lane. Good yes. curries then. I don't know. We didn't go out for curries. Oh, really? No, we had, they, food was laid on in the oh, venue. Oh, right, okay. Which was amazing. Um, so the venue was, um, it was a, a bar entertainment spot place. Um, and it's a bit quirky. It's all, it's on mm. split on three levels. It's quite narrow and long and it's got a bar at the end and a stage partway along. And the intention was to try and get people, geeks who evangelize and advocate the use of Ubuntu and free software to bring along someone else. And we talk to that someone else and show that other person who maybe is a disbeliever, um, or, you know, not yet converted. Yeah. Perhaps. Not yet, not yet part of our gang. Um, and let them know how we use Ubuntu in business and how Ubuntu is effective in business. So was it very busy? Uh, it was about uh, 200 people registered on Eventbrite for the event. Okay. And, and we anticipated about a 50% drop-off right. um, of people just not turning up or dropping us an email and saying, I can't come. Right. And, and that was pretty much what we got. 100 people turned up. Fair enough. So we got pretty much exactly the number that we, we expected. Um, we did get a fair number of techies, of, of geeks, which is kind of not the audience we wanted. We yeah. did get some people... Um, some fairly important people, you know, high up in the London Stock Exchange and cool. a few other, cool. you know, cool people. Um, and I spoke to uh, Jerry Carr from Canonical Marketing yeah. about it, and he was happy with how it went as a first run yeah. and thinks that we should do more of these yeah. um, kind of events. Um, he was more um, interested in doing more of these Ubuntu in business events, yes. uh, maybe around the country, maybe different types of venues, targeting different types of people. But I um, think, as well as that, that's from the, the canonical side. Um, and it was a joint canonical and community event. We helped mm. promote it. It was actually a, a community idea. The whole thing was thought up by Alan Bell and Alan Lord at the Open Learning Center. Yeah. So it was a community-driven event, but you know, organized together with Canonical. And they sponsored the drinks. And we had Ubuntinis. Lovely. <laughs> what Which like? are an acquired taste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you get a chance to have one... Uh, just have one. Uh, is it okay. true that they're made from um, Mark Shuttleworth socks that have been straight? Mark Shuttleworth <laughs> aubergine, aubergine socks. socks. No, they're not. Okay. Uh, you'd then. be forgiven for thinking that. <laughs> um, they're, they're a quiet taste. Anyway, um, one thing that I wanted to talk about is um, events where it's not a technical bent like, you know, lugs. And I, I blogged about this today and posted on the UK mailing list about how we go to the people and how we um, get those people interested in Ubuntu. And I was interested in hearing ideas about where we could go mm. that people are, you know, and yeah. introduce them to Ubuntu. Because it's one of the things that um, I think Dan's, Dan Lynch from the Linux, Linux Hat Laws mentioned at OGCAMP was that it, in some senses we've got we're always kind of preaching to the converted mm. at, at events like OGCAMP. You know, we sort of reinforce each other's views. We don't really go out and, and spread the word, if you like, um, mm. in the wider community. Of course, that, that, that depends on if, the, if your motivation is to get other people interested Indeed. in Ubuntu. If, if, if we take that as read, yeah. that we want other people to use Ubuntu and we want to show them how good it is. So if you take yeah. that as read, where do we go? Yeah. Well, Laura and I were at our village fate oh, yes. on Saturday, weren't we? Yes. Um, and it, 
wandering around the little stall, the, the stalls there and stuff, there were a falconry and uh, the Women's Institute and the very churches. community and focused, scouts. Isn't it? it really was very community focused, yeah. And the local photography club and things were there as well. And I said to her as I was walking around, partly jokingly, but maybe partly seriously, um, sort of saying, well, the podcast should have had a, a stand here. You know, we're the, we are almost Probably. certainly <laughs> the, the biggest podcast produced in the village. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Certainly in terms of the uh, number of downloads and stuff that we get. Um, and it would be great for people in the wider community to sort of know that this was going on in, in yeah. the local area. Um, and it, it could be a bit of a, an advocacy thing, having maybe Ubuntu there and available. Also, we could, you know, maybe try and uh, interview people. We may even have people come up to us and say, oh, yeah, I've tried that. And we could you know, get some content for the show and things as well. Yeah, one of the things we've done in the past is at Software Freedom Day, we've gone out there to the public and... Stood outside Morrison's and things like that. Well, it, on, on one occasion, we walked through through London and um, with the Greater London Linux User Group, and we had a whole bunch of CDs from mm. Canonical, and we printed out some leaflets, and we were handing them out in the street. Mm. And it's a bit of a scattergun approach. You know, you're just yeah. randomly giving CDs to people. They're not coming to you. They're not necessarily interested in what you've got to say. You're kind of, you know, in the same way as a guy stands at the corner and with a golf sale sign handing out leaflets or the guy on the corner giving out you know, discounts for McDonald's or whatever. Yeah. You, you're not going to them. You're not, you're not, whereas with a stand at something like a fate, you're standing there, you put your stand out and people can come to you, come to you yeah. if they want to. So what do you use as the, as the killer points to get people to come to your stand? You've got something to attract them. I mean, what? A juggler playing a looped video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a bit small to be seen from the other side of an event, I guess. But you've got something yeah. that says, you know, you must come here, you must try this. I think a village fate with a 42-inch plasma screen <laughs> <laughs> behind the stand. Yeah. Yeah. Quite, a video. quite a few of those stands had sweeties on them. Yeah. That, yeah, that seems to work quite well. the kids in. Yeah. Okay. Get me in. Well, uh, yeah, me too, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. A handful of those in my pocket. You just project the right image as well, haven't you? You can't just be you know, stood there in your tatty jeans and all that sort of stuff. You've got to be... Why not? Because Real people the, wear no, tatty no, no, jeans. No, because it gives the wrong image. Um, does it? Yeah, it does. Because you will be stood there giving away free software. And most people think free software is pirated and it's all ripped off films and all that sort of you stuff. You can talk to them while you do. You don't have to necessarily no, give no, them no, a CD and go, here you go, mate, have this. <laughs> yeah, but you have to actually get them to that point. What, of talking to you? Yeah. Well, the yeah, fact they've the walked up part. is a good start. Yeah, but, but even would, before then, they're going to take a look over oh, at look you. Look at that dodgy films over there. Look at that. Mm. Can you believe those people? Scruffy people giving away stolen films. Well, do you get proper ones from Canonical? You Plus, you know, nice. that Ubuntu brand, you know, it's it's surprisingly... You know, well known, well seen. You know, people. Is it? Uh, yeah, I, really? I. Well, I've told you, you numerous you, times about the guy in the corner shop who yeah. who looked at my t shirt where with a Hardy Heron on it and went, "Where have I seen that before?" And I okay. said, "Your desktop." And he went, "Oh yeah." <laughs> <laughs> I, I I wear my Ubuntu t shirts around occasionally and get spotted. Mm. I think I got spotted in um in Nice. Yeah. What? Um, Hotel yeah. in Nice. Somebody nice. was oh, looking yeah. at my t shirt. Well, I recognise that. <laughs> and um, in the local co op. And in the local co-op, rather less exotically. They're all co-op employees run Ubuntu. They must be. do. Um, but their tills certainly don't, as I saw when one crashed. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, very uh, much windows. But there are these sort of you know, wider community events where... Uh, I mean, we tried doing info point stands at uh, computer fairs, and they were reasonably successful, yeah. and that was a perhaps more geeky market. But, mm. you know, one of the things about Ubuntu is for human beings, not just kind of geeks or Nerds. a subset of people that are people who are interested in computers and computing. Um, and and pe- people at those computer fairs tend to be self-selecting. You, yeah. you yeah. wouldn't spend a Sunday afternoon in a computer fair unless you're interested in buying a hard drive enclosure or a USB key or mm, pretty you much, know, yeah. a yeah. new screen or something. And, yeah. and Alan Cox, who every month in Bracknell mm. runs a, an info point stand at a computer fair, I, I went along a couple of times and dropped off some CDs from Canonical to yeah. him. And... Um, People wander by and you know, people see him every month and yeah. come over and say hello. And sometimes there are people who go past a couple of times and then on the third occasion they'll like take a CD or something. But also you get like there are little kids walking by and they go, yeah, I use that and like wander off. Uh-huh. So, yeah, you are kind of, you know, yeah. you're not capturing many new people there. No, but I, I think Alan does a great job and he's certainly oh, totally. got a lot, lot, yeah, of sta- yeah. lot of stamina. But 
as you say, a very self-selecting uh, group, perhaps. But it would be great to see people perhaps doing uh, those sort of advocacy stands at you know school fates or whatever. It's the, it's the season for it, um, or uh, church fairs or or whatever might be going on in your community at the time. Or classes, if you go to a class of some kind, like yoga or French or something. I don't know. Evening classes. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Different set of people. One of the things that Dan Lynch mentioned again was that he, w- he went to a, a bar camp, and I can't remember which bar camp it was, but even there he found out that a lot of people weren't familiar with Linux and open source. Because uh, well, they're web developer types. Or, uh, or, or they're hardware tinkerers and they're, and they're soldering stuff and whatever, but they just weren't really into the open source thing. So even at a reasonably techie audience, there, there was a lot of people there to be to uh, to be talked about too if you see what i mean yeah and i mean he actually did an introduction to open source software i think it was mm. oh he did he liked that he talked, was, didn't he yeah i mean yeah. that was who he was pitching to so it's quite even though they were geeks mm. like some one of the one of the things that triggered off this this blog post was um amber grainer um who edits the ubuntu weekly news um went to a goat farm day thing right a uh, goat festival and um, at the goat festival, you know, her son was wearing his Ubuntu T-shirt and she was wearing hers and they were dishing out Ubuntu CD. She's got a great photo of her with a goat nice. holding a CD just before the goat munches the cardboard, I'm sure. <laughs> Satanic edition, was it? No. <laughs> no. No, they like goats. Oh, right, okay. They're not sacrificing them. Right, fair enough. Um, and it was that kind of event. It's like, you know, there's, there are people there who use computers as a tool. And these are yes. people who, you know may not appreciate that there are options out there yeah when you when you go to a, a, a techie conference people read magazines and they see mention of linux and stuff and then yeah, they think this comes back to what i started off with you've got to have a killer point to say to somebody look any other got that operating system on your pc take this away and whatever it is you'll have no more viruses there you go or it's all free you don't have to pay for anything you've got to have yeah. something to get them to have a go I don't, I don't think you have to try that hard. I really don't. Because when you've got a bunch of free things, especially CDs, computer software, and it's proper free, you know, and it's not dodgy, and, you know, you've got leaflets, and, and you can have banners up and all that kind of stuff to attract people. Yeah. And once you get them over, if you're a personable person and not, yeah. like you say, a, you know, hairy, sweaty, farty geek who's, who's you know, unapproachable, if you're, yeah. if you're the kind of person, and someone who's personable, like, that's one of the reasons why Alan Cox is so successful in Bracknell, mm. is he's a retired guy, you know, and people can walk up to him yeah, and yeah. think, oh, completely harmless bloke, yep. you know, he's not going to sell me something dodgy, and, yeah, have a chat to the guy. And yeah. if you've got people on a stand who are, you know, friendly, personable, you know, in inverted commas, normal people. So it's important, then, to, um, to get... Um, CDs from uh, from Canonical to the ship it so that you prov- uh, provide a, a professional package rather than That's just, a way. just a, yeah. I think it's probably more important to provide that than yeah. just a chunky thing that you made it yourself. Whilst we can do it, it's True. all part of the image. And, and but you know. the other side of it is people appreciate that a CD costs money, especially a professionally looking one, mm. costs money to print. So you you know you could ask for a donation or have a raffle or you know if it was that kind of oh yeah we <laughs> love raffle, raffle. casting. <laughs> But in some way, finance those CDs because they're not free. Whether whether you're paying for them or whether Canonical are paying for them, yeah. they're not free. Mm-hmm. They're you know, they're free to the end user, but someone's got to pay for them somewhere. Yeah. We used to charge for the CDs at the info points. People were quite happy to pay, and I think we yeah. just to cover costs. And we pay, I think we charged twice as much for the Ubuntu ones because at the time you got two CDs in there. Oh yeah, thing. you did. Yeah, and we sold more Ubuntu ones yeah. often than any of the others because I think because they look professional. Quid. Well, that's what well. Alan does. He he actually figured out that when you try and give them away, people don't want them. Yeah. yeah. So he charges for them. So they've got some kind because, of because yeah they 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 won't take There's them some, if they're they free. They assign some value to it. Yeah. Yeah. They won't leave and on even, the train. It's only a pound. Interesting, isn't it? You know, a pound which is what seventy cents or something like that. It's not a huge amount of money, mm-hmm. but it's enough. And. And he doesn't like make a huge amount of money, so it's not it's not morally reprehensible that he's getting free CDs from Canonical and then he's charging for them because he actually uses the money to pay for the stand, yeah. which is like twenty exactly, quid or something yeah. like That's that, what we did, yeah. and pay for the photocopying of leaflets that he produces himself. So, you know, I don't have a problem with him, you know, 
no. making money out of it. And I don't think there should be a problem for people running stands at Fates and, and other community yeah. events to make money from it and put that money back into maybe making a banner or photocopying leaflets for next time mm-hmm. and make it a sustainable thing. Yeah. One of the things that I think somebody commented is that real geeks don't go out of the house. They you know, send other people to do their shopping and things for them and therefore they're never really going to get out and do this sort of adv- advocacy. Do you think and there's any truth in that? Yeah, I think, the well, there are a certain significant proportion of the population who are, oh, sorry, a, a significant proportion of the geek population who are like yeah. that. Yeah. But I think there's enough normals out there. <laughs> Don't we should you? have a segment on that. <laughs> yeah. What is normal? It's a good question. Um, well, I mean, yeah, there are there are geeks who within our community who feel uncomfortable doing the the sales pitch, doing the yeah. you know talking to complete strangers. But if someone else did the introducing and said, oh, and by the way, this guy here is responsible for doing some funky gooey stuff. And, you know, you're actually talking to the guy who wrote that or you're talking to someone who supports people online or you're talking to a guy who translates stuff or or whatever it is, you know, then there's some, you know, there's some way to build a conversation for those people who Mm. maybe that's a bit difficult. Yeah. Okay. well. What do you think? Are we advocating Ubuntu in the right places or are we missing a trick or two here? If you want to uh, add your uh, two pence to the discussion, uh, email us at podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. It's that time again where we string all the syllables together and say it's the bit about Ubuntu. Nobody contradicts me. Excellent. Right. What's first? Shut up. What's first <laughs> in the bit? Uh Evan Dandria has uh, Mm -hmm. posted uh, on the Canonical Design blog uh, asking for support in um, petitioning for a new website to be set up. Uh, There's a website called Stack Exchange, Mm -hmm. and they set up support kind of websites, and you can petition them to ask them to create one tailored for whatever your platform or or, um, system is. Your project. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you can go to this particular URL and press a button to say, yes, I would like that. And I'm committing to helping out by answering questions or helping out in some way um, on that support site. And there's the idea of of getting points and badges and things for helping out other people. I guess a little bit like Yahoo Answers, maybe. Yeah. Um, Um, I mean, we we kind of already have something like this. Launchpad Answers. Mm. And it has karma. You get a reward for, Mm. you know, but this thing is an awful lot more pretty. Right. Um, which, you know, pretty is, a feature. pretty is good. But equally, the, the, I think the big motivation for this is that we should be sending our support people where there are people with problems. Yeah. So if there are people at Stack Exchange who have a problem with Ubuntu, then we mobilize our, you know, troops of uh, support people to go there and help them fix their stuff. Yeah, quite a few of the comments seem to be suggesting we use something called Shapado or Shapado, mm. um, which is an op- open source alternative to that. Yeah, it's a bit like the old um, should we use Twitter or Identica. Yeah, you know the the mass of people are on Twitter, but Identica is free software. Yeah, you know what's what's your ultimate goal to use free software or to address the needs of your users? Yeah, that's a good question. But, I mean, there'll be, there'll be people on both networks who need help, potentially. Mm. And the other one already exists. The yeah. Shapado one is already there and, you know, exists and there are some people there. But Stack Exchange exists as an entity and there are people there who need help. I guess I it's, it's one of these things where you just have to have as many different ways of people getting in touch with you as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some people who object to this on in, in terms of there are already support systems. You know, we've got IRC mailing lists, forums, Launchpad Answers as the yeah. official, you know, set of support systems. Yeah. Um, and why are we spreading ourselves thin across well, yet not. another one? Yeah. No. You're, you're just offering a different way of doing it. Absolutely. So it's, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, totally. And, it, and if, you like, if you're the kind of person who likes Foursquare and you like collecting your little <laughs> badges of, you know, achievements of you checked into so-and-so or you helped someone fix their wireless network then, and you're helping someone who's new with Ubuntu, then great, carry on doing it. Yeah, why not? Because you're the kind of person who's probably not going to go to a mailing list. It's that time in the release cycle again. The Ubuntu Free Culture Showcase has uh, opened its doors. You've got until the end of August to submit your RT designs, photographs and um, music and bits of video and stuff. Um, and you can get included on the desktop of the live CD. Yeah, it's all changed a bit, actually. It's um, rather than the the way we did it before, which was have a wiki page and mm. and get people to put their content on the wiki page. 
we're doing the same thing that we just talked about with Stack Exchange. We're going out to yeah. the communities that have the the artists and designers and going out and asking them uh, for their content. So going to places like Vimeo where people hang out and do their great videos and, and going to Flickr where people do great photography and, and other pictures rather than getting them to come and edit some manky wiki page. <laughs> yeah, which did get very clunky when I submitted a few ideas into it. You know, there were several other people, well, I guess a few dozen other people there, and the, the time it took to edit and render that page was enormous. Yeah. And very confusing as well. You couldn't easily just highlight your... your Whereas if we interest. go out to these communities and reach out to them and grab their yeah. content and ask them to contribute to us, I think we're more likely to get a significant number of... Decent contributions. Yeah, but I guess there will always be those people who say, well, I'm a photographer and not on Flickr, or I don't use SoundCloud, but I do music and stuff. And Flickr's not open source. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they lose then, really, don't they? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, what do you do? Mm. Yeah. There's a, I think that we could set up our own instance of something that looks a bit like <laughs> Flickr but has no users. Yeah, that would be useful. Yeah, no, I, I sort of agree. Maverick Meerkat is shaping up. We've got we're at Alpha Two now, I yeah. think, and we've got changes to the unified sound menu. Well, they're in a sketch form at the moment. Yeah, so potential changes, aren't they? Yeah, and also a suggestion that you can optionally use ButterFS. <laughs> I can I? figure out how to pronounce that. BTRFS. I can't but believe it's, it's not pronounced ButterFS, butter as in yeah, as in the butter it's spreadable. Yeah. Yes. The unified sound menu thing is quite an interesting idea. It gives you the option to have um, things like control vo- the, the level of VoIP um, applications and uh, other various sound sources all in one Ooh. in one clickable menu. I guess it's sort of the promise of Pulse Audio being delivered, really, through a GUI. Mm. The idea of being able to control all these applications independently of each other. Yeah, you can kind of do all of this but in lots of separate windows and yeah. widgets here and there, but having it all unified so that you can while you're sat at your machine and you want to mute the music that's coming out of your media center on the other side of the room because the phone's ringing, you know, you can click and, and mute from, from this little drop down menu. Mm. Or for example, if you wanted to, you know, mute the sound from this machine so that the uh, Skype or mumble or whatever your VoIP provider is can, uh, can be enabled, that kind of stuff. Which suggests that they can easily let go of the sound card for as they pass between different applications. Yeah, that would be good if that worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's ButterFS then? It's a uh, it's Oracle thing, isn't it? Oracle. Yes, developed. I think it came from there. Yeah. Uh, it's a new file, newish file system. One of the one of the new file systems. I say new because most file systems are quite old. old. And you know, if it's less than about ten years old, it's new. Um, one of the new ones is EXT4, which mm. we've supported for a couple of releases, yeah. and then there's. Uh, ZFS from Sun, yep. which we don't support because of licensing issues. Mm-hmm. We can't get it in the Linux kernel. Um, uh-huh. But I think ButterFS is supposed to support some of the neat features that ZFS has, but it's free software and can be right. in the Linux kernel. Right. It's got cool. distributed stuff in that thing as well, is not it? And all kinds of volume management type stuff that you mm-hmm. get with LVM and, and RAID and all those funky stuff. But I'm not sure I would trust that just yet. I know it was it was mentioned at UDS. I think mm. I think Scott James Remnant said in front of everyone it will be an uh, install time default, and I think it was Colin Watson who kind of went uh, no, will it? <laughs> <laughs> and so that was very quickly retracted, and it was an install time option. Uh, I'm sure that's what Scott meant in the first place. Yes, I'm yeah. sure that is. Yes, he just misread his iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, enterprise content management vendor Alfresco has been certified for work on the Ubuntu stack. Mm, excellent. Good. Yeah, this was announced at um, the Ubuntu in Business. Oh, event. brilliant. Well, it was announced elsewhere, but... Um, it was also yeah. announced that at the Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah, from the guy from... Um, oh, cool. Yeah. From uh, Alfresco. From Alfresco was there. Yeah, and uh, he announced it to everyone. Apparently, yeah. the, it's the latest version, 3.3, which is certified on 10.04, the LTS server release. Yeah. So that could stuff. be around for a long time, potentially. Yeah. It's a free software product that's used by, you know, large companies and small companies alike. And but it was on Solaris and Red Hat as well as Windows before. So now mm-hmm. it's uh, on, on Ubuntu, which is yeah. nice to see. And they've got a community edition and a, a paid support edition as well. And um, so, you know, you can download the code and use it yourself on your uh, Ubuntu system. Cool. That's excellent. Since Hofsteed um, has written an interesting blog post about how trying to raise awareness that English speakers are privileged in well in it in general and then i think goes on to talk about ubuntu specifically Mm. um 
things like the fact that IT um, terms are, and functions in programming are typically in English. And then you get things like if you're in a forum and you don't type absolutely perfect English, people pick you up on your spelling and assuming that you're just a bad English mm. typist. And yet it could be somebody's really spent a lot of time trying to construct this question and you're just sort of throwing it away and it's hard to get involved. Um, so I think there's some really interesting points in there. Yeah, he does some good analysis of um, the yeah. Ubuntu community. Yeah, you're on there. Yeah, I've just noticed that. <laughs> Good. Um, but no, it's just a list of, uh, you know, members of uh, the major councils in, yeah. in Ubuntu, the Community Council, Forum Council, IRC, Loco Council, mm-hmm. and Technical Board, and what their um, country of origin and native language is. Yeah. And um, yeah, it is predominantly English UK and English US. Yeah, and there's a few New Zealanders and things in there as well, or uh, Australians as well. But yeah, uh, basically, it's predominantly English speaking, isn't it? Which is quite disproportionate when you when you look at it. So it is an eye opener. He says it's it's not intended as a rant. It's an eye opener, not an eye slammer. Yeah, and it is yeah. an eye opener. Yeah, it certainly made me think a little bit about it. It would be uh, really interesting to find out from people who are not native English speakers uh, the experience that they've had when they've been trying to get involved in the Ubuntu community or, and participate in these things. If they found it difficult because you know, their language skills are. Uh, uh, are not so good in English. I'd as certainly other be people. interested in that. One of the things we have is mo- all, most of the organisation um, mailing lists, for example, are English, yeah. and most of the organisational IRC channels are English language. So the hash Ubuntu support channel is English. Okay, we have Ubuntu dash fr for French speakers yeah. and es for Spanish. Mm. But if someone wants to get the most number of eyeballs on their problem, they go to an English speaking IRC channel or an English-speaking mailing list to get the most number of people potentially supporting them. No, that can be a problem for them. If, it is. You know. It's an interesting dilemma. I mean, yeah. do we want to... We. Does somebody want to divert um, people into helping translate or... Well, it's not necessarily about the no, translations. Okay. It's about the lingua franca, a of, of franca of, of the distribution itself. The language that's spoken at UDS is all English. Yeah. The language that's on most of the technical lists is, is English. And whether that... Yeah, predominantly leads to, to native English speakers being the loudest voices, if you like, on some of those forums. Yeah, for, forums. <laughs> Sorry, and, <laughs> and, and, and the documentation team, ENUS, is the default language, and right. it's up to the it's up to the loco teams to translate that into into other languages. Mm. So he's absolutely right. We are very privileged, aren't we? Mm. Yeah, which is good because my foreign language skills are appalling. <laughs> <laughs> I did count myself very lucky. Dell have put up a web, web page advising people how they should choose between Windows and Ubuntu, which has caused a little bit of consternation among some in the Ubuntu community. Uh, Dell have obviously been shipping Ubuntu as an option on some of their netbooks and laptops for a while now. But I guess in order to clarify for people uh, which, whether they should choose Windows or Ubuntu and reduce the number of returns and things like that, they put a little guide up and it has some corking little phrases Ooh. in there. Ubuntu is not a Microsoft Windows operating system, it says, fair enough, and is not compatible with Microsoft Office programs. Hmm. Okay. Which factually Fact, is not one hundred percent compatible. Okay, so it's important you make the right choice. Well, okay, yep, yeah, okay. Choose Windows if you are already using Windows programs like Microsoft Office and iTunes, etc., and want to continue using them. How would you know if you don't want to? Get, oh. <laughs> if you are familiar with Windows and you do not want to learn new programs for email, word processing, etc., that assumes that you're using Windows only. Oops. And the best one: you are new to using computers. Choose Windows if you're new to using computers. On the other hand, you should choose Ubuntu if you do not plan to use Microsoft Windows. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, or you are interested in open source programming. But it sounds like they're aiming it at people who don't actually care very much. I like the way so. they've got a Windows XP screenshot there. Yes. Rather than a Windows 7, you know, current product. Hmm. Because it's familiarity, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I recognise that. I'll go for that. It's got clouds and a green thing. Green f- What's the Ubuntu feel. one of? It looks like netbook, some sort of netbook tweak. Do you know that doesn't look like anything I've ever seen before? <laughs> I can see an Amarok picture in there and a bunch of other stuff and a load of... It's got Minesweeper. It's got Minesweeper. Okay, that's, uh, we're okay. That's, <laughs> that's what you want. Gosh. But that is... Uh, that's that's a, a shocking page, isn't it, really? Yeah. I mean, mm. Canonical had no input whatsoever. No. Probably not. Well, when, I, when I was at UDS, I was chatting to one of the um, OEM guys, and he said at Dell, they they certify huge numbers of their machines to run on Ubuntu, and Canonical work very hard with them to make sure their stuff works on mm-hmm. Ubuntu. Yeah. 
but it's up to each of the countries to decide which hardware they ship. So when someone complains that oh, Dell don't sell in my country, that's totally down to Dell and the the head of that region or that country who decides what selection of uh, servers, desktops and laptops that they're going to sell. And if they right. choose that they don't want to sell Ubuntu in that region, then it won't be sold. It's as simple as that. It does say at the top of the page, Dell recommends Windows 7. Yeah, they all say that because that's part of their deal with, with Microsoft. But Indeed. that doesn't mean that doesn't necessarily mean you have to give a, a a rather slanted view later on down the page. It is incredibly frustrating. I mean, we reported a, a, a few weeks ago on the uh, the you know, reasons you should choose Ubuntu that that Dell had on their um, their site, and it actually listed you know window uh, Ubuntu doesn't get viruses, and mm. they reworded that slightly to make it you know. Be, I mean, I know we never will, but it'd be great to understand the business model behind this because it's got to come down to money at the end. They're not going to make as much money from selling Ubuntu systems. I don't, well, I, most of the licensing costs for Windows that are added onto the hardware go straight to Microsoft. So I'm not sure There's whether not they... not much money on a, on a Windows license. No, exactly, yeah. There's very little money in a Windows license. So if you, um, and they also get paid to put all the crapware that you get on there. The, the, <laughs> you know, the, all the other stuff. All the other add-ons. And, yeah, yeah, the yeah. antivirus that gets pre-installed, the AOL dialer that gets reinstalled, <laughs> and you know, all the other rubbish that you get on there. Oh, Do I you think they've that. had a lot of returns of people who've been, not missold, but yeah, mislit, misled that it's cheaper or something, therefore they've yeah. got it? We have had reports, I think, before about people who uh, suggesting that they've had higher return rates on Ubuntu things because people were expecting Windows. And that must but be expensive. To say that them. Ubuntu is only of interest to people who are interested in programming is misleading. And only and open source programming. Open source programming, yeah. 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 And to say that Windows is entirely suitable for those who are new to using computers, whereas Alan has proven with Mumbuntu mm-hmm. that that is not necessarily the case. <laughs> My mum would disagree with that. I think maybe you should talk to Dell. I'll get my mum to talk to Dell. <laughs> I'm looking forward to somebody from Dell sending an anonymous email so we can uh, understand it and sort of tell everybody. Yeah, or a less anonymous email and come on and explain yourself on the show. That would be great. never going to have Fat uh, chance. It could happen. Well, there we go. There's a challenge. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, we've learned a lot about Ubuntu there. And that's all in the bit about Ubuntu this time. It's time for some of your feedback. Alessandro Pignotti commented on the website about the last episode. During the podcast, it's incorrectly stated that LightSpark is only for videos and is not a full Flash environment. Oops. LightSpark's goal is to support the most recent Flash files, versions 9 and 10, that are not supported by Nash. Nash. The current development focus is supporting YouTube first, but over time, everything will be supported. Excellent. A plan. Hmm? Yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's a big project. Yeah, it is, and, and it's a several... constantly moving. Well, I guess not a moving target if they set the goal to be compatible with a specific set of versions of Flash. Yeah, yeah, and several people have tried and fallen by the wayside along the years. Hmm. Ben Thorpe sent us a long email about the article, which reported that iPhone users pay for apps more than Android users. Maybe the question is more: Why do iPhone users spend so much on apps, rather than why Android users spend less? Because Apple holds a tight rein on the App Store, the signal-to-noise ratio is much less, and thus people are more likely and more willing to fork out cash. The stats are probably only pulled from the Android marketplace and not other options, and a number of vendors, for instance Gameloft, are distributing paid apps through other delivery mechanisms. Equally, a number of phone providers are also bundling their own app stores with their phones, like Orange, further muddying the waters. Hmm. You've got an Android phone, haven't you? I have. Have you bought any apps not from the Android marketplace? Have you bought oh, any no. apps? No, I have bought some apps, yeah. Um, I bought uh, a game. All through the marketplace? Yeah. Yeah, same here. I yeah. bought one app through the marketplace. Mm-hmm. I, In fact, I knew there were other ways to get apps. I knew mm. you could manually install apps, but I haven't. And I've and installed a few free apps manually, yep. but personally, and I'm a techie, and I've never installed an app using, you know, whatever game lofts. I think that's part thing. of the problem. Because you're a techie, you know that you want to keep your system fairly light and you don't want it full of th- junk. No, no, I don't think that's it. I, no? I, no, not me personally. I mean, I've had a look at App Brain, which is another one of these like marketplace y things mm-hmm. where you go to the website and you pick and choose the apps and they sync to your phone and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I've never installed a paid app through that. I haven't got Ben's original email here, but we obviously edited it down a little bit to fit it in. Um, but he says that he's bought, I think, about eight or nine apps through the Android store and one app through Gameloft. Mm. Um, so it, I don't know, you've got to think the majority of them have got to be through the Android store, really. Well, well unless, as he says, the companies that provide their own, their own store. But yeah. I'm on Orange and I don't have a... 
No, I don't. A different either. app store. But then I didn't buy my phone through an Orange store, so yeah. I don't know that I've got a branded. I, I don't know if that's only on certain phones or only on certain uh, versions of Android, but mine's certainly the only store I have by default is the Android store. So are there many free apps um, on the Apple store? Or they're all paid for? Uh, there's a fair number, yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, Claire's got um, an iPhone 4. Mm hmm. And I asked her, casually thinking about this the other day, how many apps has she bought? And she says she's bought a few. Yeah, mm. a fair few. More, mm. more than me. And she's had it two weeks. Mm. And she's bought wow. more. And I've had mine a year. Has Ben got a point about the uh, signal-to-noise ratio, though? The idea that perhaps there are better quality apps in... No, the I could sit there on the Apple Store and scroll, 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 scroll and see nothing of vague interest. Right. <laughs> to yeah. you. To me. But I'm a user, you know, like yeah. anyone else, you know. I don't know. It's, everyone has their own, like, you know, Ben has installed loads of apps and mm. I'm sure other people will install loads, like Claire has installed loads of apps. So, I don't know. Mm. These people who do surveys must know something. Les Quarter Pounder emailed in to tell us what he does with his joggler. I'm currently using mine as an advert for Ubuntu at various events, including Bar Camp Blackpool. This was made possible thanks to some YouTube videos created by Arthur. After learning some valuable lessons when running the Ubuntu install fest at Camp 10, I realised that an advert of what Ubuntu can do would really benefit attendees. And the form factor of the joggler, plus its powerful speakers, really draws the crowd in, especially when I show them that it's running Ubuntu Netbook Remix 9.10. Cool. That's rather cool, isn't it? That's a good idea. Yeah, the, we try and remember to put a link to that video in the show notes. He says, delegating that task to Alan. Um, <laughs> you but don't have Flash. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder what kind of stuff he shows off. Does he just leave a video running? or? Uh, I think it's basically on a little loop. And it just oh, sort okay. of shows the things you can do with... Uh, and people with can come over and have a play with it as yeah. well. And yeah. And I, and I like the idea, as you say, the form factor of the joggler being quite eye-catching. The only problem I have with that is that it might give a bit of a duff impression of what Ubuntu is capable of. Because <laughs> it's not the fastest thing on the world. And if people, someone went and touched a, uh, a joggler and started playing with it and, you know, they didn't get a very prompt reaction, they might think, yeah. God, this is rubbish software. Maybe it's just the video. Yeah. Maybe it's just an attractor thing to get people in. And then show them a stunky great cray <laughs> running proper desktop. Running the spinning cube. <laughs> Mark Johnson added. Popey mentioned the CPU being a bit weedy. Apparently, due to the cooling issues, the heatsink being consisting of a thermal pad, some plastic and the stand, it has to throttle down to 800 megahertz as soon as you start doing anything vaguely taxing. I'm planning to replace a bit of the plastic with a metal one like the guides on jugglerwiki.info. Hopefully that'll give it a bit more breathing space and maybe allow me to remove the sticky out bit of the stand. The technical terms coming to the front <laughs> yes, there. Yes. The uh, jogglerwiki.info site does look quite interesting. If you've got a joggler and feel like modding it or customising it, it's worth uh, having a look at. I think the community's kind of died down a little bit. The, the, the number of edits on that wiki has certainly gone down. Is that because they've stopped selling them all? Uh, partly, but also because I think people have realised there's not actually a tremendous amount you can do <laughs> with a juggler. <laughs> Even this uh, idea of replacing the heatsink does involve, it see, well, it seems to involve having great big bits of metal sticking out the front and back of it. <laughs> which um, Attractive. Mm, yeah, but, you know, maybe it's useful to be able to run more than 800 megahertz on I, that thing. I think there are certain mods that, that are useful, like take it apart and pull the Wi-Fi thing out. If you're going to use it on a wired network, because it's got a USB port on the inside, mm. you can stick a, a large capacity USB stick inside it. Oh, right. So there are some mods that are quite useful. Mm. Oh, is that because the wireless is a USB dongle? Yeah. Oh, right. Oh, well, okay. inside? Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or you could so. replace it with a different wireless dongle if you really wanted to. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine why. <laughs> Given the one that's in there fits. Works. And works, yeah. Hmm. On the subject of OddCamp, Alistair McKinley wrote, You have to remember that there are 50 million people not in London. Also, for me to travel down to London, I live in Glasgow, it would cost me a lot of money and take about 13 hours on the train. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying don't do it in the South. I'm just saying don't think everyone lives there. I like the whole changing where the venue is, and I think it would be great to have one in the South, because then we could do one in Scotland another time. That'd be great. It would be lovely to have it in anywhere in the UK. Yeah. This, this was in response to somebody's email last time, saying that yes. they thought the population of geeks yeah, in the, the world was in London. Pa paraphrase was, more people live in the South, therefore, therefore. it should be in the South. <laughs> yeah, Which I totally disagree with too. Well, yeah. The only the only reason that it's probably more likely to be in the south is because that's where we live, and it's physically yeah. easier to plan. Yes, I mean, there's an advantage to having somewhere 
uh, someone who lives in the area where it is for very practical reasons. And Dan did a great job with that in Liverpool. We haven't discussed what may or may not happen next year, but if he's not feeling up to that workload next time around, then it will probably be somewhere closer to where we live. I this, think it's safe to say it won't be in Liverpool next time around. Yeah, okay, <laughs> this, this happens with every community, though, doesn't it? With, like, lugs and, you know, lug radio and ev- any community where you're, you're doing an event, there's always going to be people who are going to be put out and not able to get to it because it's far away or it's inconvenient yeah. or it's expensive or for whatever reason. But, but the thing yeah. is, what are we providing? You know, anybody can organise an event. If you want one in Glasgow... Organise one in Glasgow. Absolutely. I will come to Glasgow. Yep. No, I think we all I'll would. come as well if you pay my travel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're not allowed to fly. But that, yeah, that, is, that is a problem. When you're like organising these events and you get emails from people who, you know, I'm not saying specifically Alistair, but, you know, you get emails from people having, you know, a bit of a pop because, you, because of the location you're organising it. Yet some of these people don't actually turn up or, you know, mm. drop you an email the day before and say, oh, actually, I can't make it for whatever reason. You know, and there's genuine reasons not to be able to turn up. But for, you know, for, it's sending an email from the armchair. Oh, I think you should do it in this location and then not turn up is kind of irritating <laughs> yeah. or not actually help organise it in that sure. location. Yeah. You know, the fact is mm. someone's got to organise it. Yeah. Anton Piatic asks, have you thought about doing a help wanted segment? I know Debian send out the help wanted section in some of their mailing list regular posts, mostly talking about packaging, translating, upgrade testing help. There must be similar things going around Ubuntu, and perhaps some of these are are something that an average listener could help with if only they knew that help was wanted in that area. Hmm. Hmm. What, specific help in a particular package or something, or just in general, we need translators or... (laughs) Possibly. A help email list. Specifically help. Hmm. Obviously, the Ubuntu UK forums are chocker and some would say not particularly useful or helpful so <laughs> yeah an ubuntu uk help email list and it's just about help but well, I, I would don't. you want to subscribe to a thing that's just constant people going help me help me but doesn't he what? mean on the podcast i think he does yes. i think so <sighs> but we're always happy to kind of mention projects and stuff yeah yeah totally yes, yeah, people in. have help that they they want to you know need mm. and they want us to announce it i'm not sure that we're the we're the best people to deliver that kind of message uh, i don't know well, we can pass it on yeah, yeah, sure, we can. But I don't know if we reach. I don't know if we reach the right people, do we? Saves trying it's to true. find other content. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. It'll make a nice interview, at least. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Speaking of generating content, if you have any feedback for us, <laughs> send us an email: <laughs> podcast at ubuntu uk dot org. Now, before we finish the feedback, Alan oh, has go. been. Oh yes, uh, poking around looking for some praise for himself on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> that's not uh, fair. <laughs> It's marginally true. And in doing so, found out that we have lots of feedback on iTunes. Now, Alan Ooh. being the only Mac user, is the only person who checks iTunes. Uh, you but, do realise that iTunes runs on Windows as well. And it can run in... Out of Windows. the four of us here. Who's running Windows? You're the only person who runs iTunes. Okay. I think I'm right in saying, Absolutely. yeah. So that's you, what I meant. You can run it, though. I could, if I... Yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> but I don't. So, out of the four of us here who, who does run iTunes, Alan is the one who can look at the feedback. And he found some feedback, and it was... Uh, overall, overall positive good that's nice good. yes what, how many stars do we get they do a star rating don't they? Um, it varies actually and I didn't record that okay. <laughs> it, was, it was mostly fours I it, think. Was, <laughs> it, it was all either fours or fives fours or fives wow. excellent yeah we had some good. some little comments didn't Should we I give you some yeah go on then some of these uh, on, and these are not in any particular order uh, we had someone called True Boy say great listen always looking out for the next release well produced and kept light-hearted without missing the point good work oh that's very good thank you very much um somebody called fizzy chicken that's fizzy chicken uh says a very well put together podcast entertaining and insightful hosts recommended i like that thank you very much thank you very much fizzy chicken lee 194 said uh would recommend to anyone who wants to learn more about ubuntu joff underscore com (laughs) (laughs) they're not made for reading out are they Anyone who uses Ubuntu should give this a listen to. You will learn a lot more, and it's funny as well. Dave1022, friend of the show, says, a very good podcast done with a great bunch of guys and Laura. Whether you're an Ubuntu <laughs> newbie or a command line power user, you'll love this cast. Thank, Thank you, Dave. That's guys in the androgynous sense, I think. <laughs> Somebody called... Speak for yourself. <laughs> I mean, the general sense. Yes, somebody that's called, right. right. <laughs> somebody called Tux Lover says, great stuff, funny, and info. Thanks, guys. Uh, again, and Laura. And Laura. <laughs> Aside, and Laura. <laughs> Fishley, Fishley simply says, uh, cool. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Fishley. And Tiffar says, great podcast. I like the content on the interviews. Very informative and funny as well. Keep up the good work. 
So if you're a, a user of iTunes, then feel free to leave us a comment. And, nice one, special. Uh, well, I don't, well, it's fine. <laughs> Positive and negative, you know, we welcome all kinds of feedback. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook, IRC channels, everything you need to know. Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Have a week. Bye.